Over a week had already passed since Kelsey's funeral when Madison received a call from Zach. It was the afternoon, and she was at the apartment when her phone rang. She picked up, surprised and a little excited. Brother, she said, full of newfound energy. On the other side of the line, Zach paused. It still felt strange for him to hear her refer to him like that again. After all, their relationship was not that of typical siblings. In the years that Madison had lost her memory, Zach had found her, and they had lived as a couple for three years. However, that had all changed, and they had been forced to go back into their old roles. This made Zach especially uncomfortable. Are you free this afternoon? Why don't we go out for a meal together? He asked her, his voice low, deep, and somewhat strained. Sure, she agreed without even thinking about it. Let's do it. They set the time and place and then carried on casually chatting for a while. When Madison hung up, she sat on her bed with a smile on her face, happy to have regained what she had lost. She looked up and noticed Ian standing in the doorway, leaning against the frame with his hands in his pockets. He looked very relaxed in his slippers, but his smile was a little awkward. Madison didn't notice this, however. She just put her phone down and ran up to him on her tiptoes. She wrapped her arms around him and hugged him closely. I'm going out to eat with my brother today. I'm so excited, she said happily. He bent down to make it easier for her to embrace him and looked at her with loving eyes, wrapping his arms around her waist. Well, if it's your brother that's inviting you to dinner, then go right ahead. She smiled, elated, the corners of her eyes crinkling. She leaned into him and played with his big, warm palm. Do you think this means that nothing has changed between Zack and me, and we can go back to being siblings? She asked him. I know that he can't bear to part with his younger sister, he told her softly, looking down into her eyes. No one would be willing to part with a person like you. Go and enjoy your afternoon. Nodding, she went back into the room to get changed. She grabbed a small bag and kissed Ian on her way out. I might come back a little late. Don't worry about me, she told him as she disappeared from his sight. He stood in the empty room, his gentle smile gradually losing its warmth, and stared in the direction she had left as if waiting for her to turn around and come back. With a sigh, Ian went to sit on the couch and watch the sunset. There was no telling what he was thinking. The phone beside him started ringing repeatedly, but it eventually ran out of battery and fell silent. The Napoleon room was the same it had been five years before, and Madison felt an overwhelming sense of familiarity when she stepped inside. Mrs. Weston, this way, please, a waiter said when he saw her. He went forward to greet her as if he knew her and led her over to the private room where Zack was already waiting. Hi, bro, she said, smiling. As she said it out loud into his face, she realized that it was very difficult to separate herself from their relationship as brother and sister. She pretended like nothing had happened between them in the past to suggest that there were anything but that. Have you ordered yet? I'm really hungry. With a smile, he quickly called the waiter over to order. When the table was full of dishes, they chatted endlessly as they ate. He had expected Ian to come along, and he was a bit surprised that Madison had arrived alone. Where's Ian? I wanted to thank him, he asked. She furrowed her eyebrows and drifted away in her mind for a moment. Zack was busy pouring a bowl of soup for her and didn't notice her reaction. On the day that Dad was released, Mom and I were too busy with Kelsey's funeral and didn't even arrange for someone to pick him up. Ian remembered and sent someone over to get him. I wanted to say thanks. She listened to his words blankly. She hadn't known about any of that. Zack realized that something was wrong with her, and he asked, Wait, didn't he tell you? I thought that he would join you today, since the two of you like to do these kinds of things together. She took a sip of her soup. She hadn't even thought of inviting Ian, and he had been right by her side when Zack had called her. Zack didn't think too much about it. He just assumed that Ian had something else to do. Are they all right? she asked. John and Stella were just them to her now. There was no way for them to go back to being a family. Kate should be fine at home, right? They're not doing well, to be honest, 
he replied. You know how much they loved Kelsey. It was a really big blow for them. Kate should be fine, though. I'd just give it a few days. Their eyes met, and he pondered for a while as he prepared to tell her about the family's plan. However, they were interrupted by a noise behind the door. It sounded like a group of people had been rejected by someone, and were furiously muttering about it. It seemed that their banquet was over. Seriously, if I'd have known that he wasn't coming, I would have stayed at home, one of the voices said. But what can you do about it? He's our boss. Mr. Weston was supposed to meet up with an old friend at the Griffin today. I heard that he stood them up, though even though they came back from France. That's pretty rude. Madison's eyes widened as the people chatted on and on. I forgot. Damn it, I forgot. She cursed internally. Ian had told her about the dinner at the funeral. After their plans to go to France had been disrupted, Ian's friend had agreed to fly over instead. They had set up a meeting for that evening, but she had forgotten all about it after receiving Zack's call. Immediately, Zack saw that something was wrong. They had grown up together after all, and he knew her well. Don't tell me you forgot, he asked. She bit her lip helplessly, remembering the look on Ian's face when she had told him. She felt her heartache, and she looked up at her brother apologetically. She had been so happy to hear from him that she had completely forgotten about her evening with Ian. She knew that her husband must be unhappy with her, but he hadn't said a word to remind her of their plans. Excuse me for a moment, I just need to make a call, she said. She took out her phone and dialed Ian's number, but his phone was turned off. She tried calling their apartment next, but no one answered there either. She began to panic. Is he angry? She wondered. Zack saw that she didn't want to eat anymore and stood up. He picked up the car keys from the table and said, Come on, I'll take you there. You might even make it on time. She nodded and followed him out quickly, leaving a large portion of their dinner behind. The drive from the Napoleon room to the Griffin was a long one, even without any traffic. But they weren't so lucky as to have a clear road. When they arrived at their destination, it was already ten o'clock. Sam called Zack away, and Madison rushed inside. She found Ian standing by the door, watching a car leaving. She ran over to him in a hurry, panting. She threw a discouraged look at the leaving car before turning back to her husband. They're gone? Why didn't you remind me? She demanded, feeling hurt and guilty. Mr. Williams and Francis were standing behind him, but they didn't leave when they saw her. Ian smiled at her. It's okay, you can come next time. Why couldn't he just remind me? Why did he have to make me feel so uncomfortable about it now? She thought unhappily. Are you full? He asked, changing the topic. He looked over his shoulder at the men behind him, and they turned around and left after giving Madison meaningful looks that went directly over her head. Would you like to accompany me for a second dinner? She followed him inside, still a little grumpy. They were brought something to eat at once, and soon the table was covered in Madison's favorite dishes. Seriously, Ian, she muttered to herself. She was complaining, but her tone was a little coquettish. Would it have killed you to just remind me? You know that I have a memory of a goldfish. He laughed and comforted her, and the matter passed just like that, with neither of them bringing it up again. However, other issues were soon to arise. The next morning, Madison left for work early because of the A1 logistics advertisement. Ian was also about to head out, but his phone rang. When he saw that the caller was his family home number, he knew exactly what was going on, even before picking up. I'll be right there, he said into the receiver, not even giving the person on the other side a chance to speak. Just like that, he hung up. Several things need to be done. Besides, the Westons should have already received news of him meeting up with Sally the previous day. Sally Knight was his friend from whom he had been studying medicine overseas. She was the daughter of his mentor. She was the same age as Madison, but she had lost her husband in an accident two years earlier. Now, she was single. Her father, Charlie Walton, was a specialist in the surgical field, 
and Sally was a famous figure in the psychiatric field. Naturally, the reason for which he had met up with her was quite sensitive. The entire family, except for Madison, had gathered at the Weston house, where they were waiting for Ian to arrive. They had chosen to hide the matter from Madison, feeling that she might choose to leave Ian if she found out what was going on. When Ian arrived, he walked in and took his usual seat, his expression neutral. Olivia and Edward sat opposite him, carefully observing him. Daniel sat to the side, frowning deeply, and Cassandra studied Ian suspiciously. There was no one else in the room, just the closest family members. A strange atmosphere filled the place. Don't look at me like that, Ian told Cassandra. It's like you're afraid of me. Watch out or I'll give you a reason to feel that way. They all looked at him, shocked and saddened by his words. Cassandra's eyes burned red, filling with tears. Daniel closed his eyes and took a deep breath, and Olivia bit her lip, holding back her tears. The only calm person in the room was Edward. He stood up and walked over to Ian, patting his son on the shoulder. Has the diagnosis been confirmed? He asked. It has. It seems to be a paranoid mental illness brought on by genetic factors. Ian told them without hesitation. A painful silence followed his simple sentence. Olivia got up and walked over to him. She squatted down by his chair and pushed Edward aside gently. Touching Ian's cheek, she started crying. Don't be afraid, she consoled him, unable to accept that her son was ill. We're not afraid. Don't worry. We're looking for a doctor to treat you. You can get better. You still have so much ahead of you. This... It's going to be okay. When they found out about Alan's illness, they had done an extensive amount of research on the matter. They had been surprised to find out that the illness was something passed on from generation to generation throughout the entire family line. Nobody had been able to find out what it was, but Alan's life had been a good one, anyway, before he died on the plane. But Ian... He leaned into Olivia's palm, but there was no emotion in his eyes. Why does it have to be a mental illness, right? He asked indifferently. She trembled and embraced him. It'll be fine, I promise. Your father found a way to live with it, and you've gotten further than him, too. You're a doctor. You'll be okay, I promise. Just trust me. I believe in you. We all do. She mumbled. Beside them, Cassandra began crying. She had searched for all the information she could get after finding out about Ian's issues, but she still felt so helpless. There was no saying if Ian would ever be able to get to the point where his illness didn't bring him down or pose difficulties for him in his life. There was no simple medical cure. It couldn't just be operated out of his body. Nobody knew where he would be in five or ten years. Didn't you meet with Sally? Olivia asked him anxiously. What about Charlie? Maybe they can help you figure something out? She hadn't slept well since finding out that Ian's condition was getting worse, and she looked a little haggard. What about the rights, didn't they say? Mom, he interrupted her sternly. He was finding it increasingly hard to keep his emotions in check with his family. She bit her lip to prevent herself from crying and looked at her son, who was buried in her arms. She knew that he was an adult man. She knew that he was a successful doctor, and that he even had a wife and daughter. But to her, he would always be a child. She couldn't stand for her child's suffering because of this illness. Realizing that he had lost control over his emotions, he hugged her more tightly and buried his face into her shoulder. Don't say it, he pleaded with her, knowing exactly what she was thinking. I'm begging you. I don't want to hear those words. She cried but remained silent. If she had to choose between her son's immediate happiness and his health, she would always choose his health. After all, if he was being pulled down by his illness, he wouldn't have much of a chance at long-term happiness anyway. All she wanted was for him to live a good life. Mom, please. I can't live without her. I can't lose her again. She's my medicine. She's the reason that I can keep going. Please don't force me to do that. His words fell heavily into the silent room, and they could all feel his pain. If he didn't accept the help of the Wright's doctor, 
How much more of that pain would he have to suffer? No one could say for sure. I don't want to hurt her, Mom. I don't want her to cry. He looked up at Olivia with reddened eyes. Can't you just trust me for once? I can control myself. I'll get treatment. I won't give up. And I'll do my best to keep stable. Just trust me, okay? She gave him a sad smile and nodded. Okay, she agreed. But if I find out that your condition isn't under control, I'll ask Madison to divorce you. And I'll do everything in my power to make her leave you. You understand that, right? He nodded stiffly, knowing that it was his only choice. He already knew what would happen if his family didn't accept Madison. They wouldn't be able to live a good life together in that situation. However, he had also resolved. If one day he found that he couldn't keep himself stabilized, he would let go of her. Even if it hurt him to his very core. He could deal with that. What he couldn't deal with was hurting her. Sometime later, he left the living room and went upstairs. Sitting down on the edge of his bed, he stared blankly at the sunlight outside the window. It was rare for him to feel empty, but for a moment his mind was clear. Soon, thoughts of Madison crept in, and his head was filled with his wife once more. Perhaps it was because of his paranoia, but the topic quickly changed to Madison and Jason. The more he dwelled on it, the more he became certain that she would happily leave him for that man. He remembered just how easily she had forgotten about him when Zack had called, and he wondered if she would forget about him just as easily if Jason did come to take her away from him. He didn't know when it had started, but she was surrounded by so many people. So many men. She cared so much about all those other people that she forgot about him even when he was standing right beside her. She had forgotten about their plans, and ignored his feelings completely. He had to keep himself from threatening her into disdain, but he had no idea when he had lost control over himself like that. His phone rang, and he tilted his head when he saw her name on the screen. Madison? He said, sitting still. He loved her name, and every time he said it out loud, it was like he could see her sweet smile. However, all he felt at that moment was bitterness. The phone kept ringing, but he could only watch it buzz. She called twice, and then the phone didn't ring again. In the silence, he gave a small smile. Perhaps if he managed to put some distance between them now, the damage he did later would be smaller. He closed his eyes and sneered at himself. He had thought since the beginning that he would be separate from her. Yet he had still fantasized about being able to stay by her side, even if he knew that it was just a fantasy. Madison frowned at her phone, worried when Ian didn't pick up even on the second call. What's wrong? Allie, who was sitting beside her desk, twirling her pen, looked up at her, a meaningful expression on her face. I don't know. Maybe he's just busy, Madison replied. She set the phone down and continued working. She could feel a sense of panic and uneasiness creeping up on her. Allie watched her, biting her lip. Maybe he's not feeling well. He seems pretty tired lately, Allie suggested. Madison looked up at her, frowning. Her eyes were deep and dark. Madison shook her head. I don't think so. He's never sick, she said. She was no longer in the mood for work. Why don't you go to the company and check up on him? Allie suggested. Madison smiled helplessly. She didn't think that Ian was sick, but she still decided to go. As she was leaving, Allie handed her a document. Daniel left this with me. Can you send it over to him, please? I can't go right now. Madison nodded and took the document before heading over to the company. Allie watched her slip the document into her bag and gulped nervously. She didn't want to hide something so important from her best friend. Although Daniel had told her that everything was fine, they didn't know what could happen in the future. She wanted to give the information to Madison in a roundabout way just in case. Maybe she would figure it out. Allie's actions didn't seem strange to Madison at all. She sometimes helped Allie run errands, so it was nothing unusual. She called a cab, and once inside, she looked out the window. Her thoughts drifting. She thought about Ian. 
It was true that he had been acting a little differently, especially when they had been in England. Even now, she was still on edge, waiting for him to lose control again. It had troubled her, but then Kelsey had died, and they had somehow managed to put it behind them. The car stopped abruptly, and Madison lunged forward. The bag fell off the seat, and the contents scattered all over the floor. Sorry, miss, the car before us. He apologized, but she waved it off. It's fine, just focus on driving, she said. She bent down to pick up the things and noticed the heading on the document. It said, Intense Paranoia. Madison raised her eyebrows and read through the text quickly. She shook her head and picked up the remaining pages, organizing them back into the folder one by one. The first ten pages were an introduction to the diagnosis. She spent the rest of the way slightly bored as she absentmindedly flipped through them. They didn't particularly pique her interest, however. When the car arrived at the company, she hurriedly put the folder back into her bag and got out of the car. As she walked up to the building, she wondered why Daniel had started being interested in psychiatry all of a sudden. Whenever she went to the company, she would walk inside directly, which was why she was surprised when the receptionist stopped her at the desk. The Westons aren't here today, she told her. Madison blinked and took out the folder Allie had given to her. She waved it before the receptionist's eyes and asked, Really? What about Daniel? I've got a document for him. Could you please give it to him when he comes back? The receptionist took the folder and smiled politely at her. Madison thanked her and left the building. Once outside, the smile on her face dropped. They're not here. Why didn't I know about that? Did something happen to them? She thought. She walked down the street in a daze. There was a growing uneasiness in her heart. Even when no one else was at the company, Daniel was usually inside. But now they were all gone. She wanted to see Ian and hug him. Having him by her side gave her peace of mind. On her way, she called a cab and dialed the Weston home number. She also gave the driver the Weston home address, although she couldn't be sure that was where they were. Before she could change her mind, they were already heading in that direction, and Madison only hoped that everything would be all right. In the Weston living room, the whole family sat together. Ian was upstairs in his room, and they were all at a loss for what to do. Is there no other way? Olivia asked, refusing to believe that they had reached a dead end. He's a doctor. Doesn't he know someone who can help him with this? After a while, Daniel said, I know someone who can help. He's the top man in the psychiatry department. His name is Alfred Walker. He's a medical genius backed by the rights. He's working for them right now. Neither Olivia nor Edward said anything. Although the Westons had a history of mental illness in the family, they had never specifically hired a family psychiatrist like the Wrights. They didn't have much knowledge in the field, but they had heard of Alfred, and he truly was the best in the field. He was an especially prominent figure in Henry Wright's generation, and he was the talent that the Wrights had nurtured for years. Should I ask him if we can hire him to treat Ian? Daniel suggested, almost as if he was speaking to himself. The Wrights... Olivia took a deep breath. Her eyes were full of determination. I'm not asking for a miracle. All I want is for Ian to have a good life. For that, I'll do anything it takes. I'll give the Wright family anything they ask for. With that, she turned around angrily and left for her room. At that moment, the housekeeper came into the room and told them that Madison had arrived. Cassandra grew even more nervous, and Daniel frowned. Olivia stopped in the middle of the staircase and pondered what to do for a moment. Without a word, she went back down. It would be the first time that Madison would see her angry like that. Soon, Madison came into the room and sensed the strange atmosphere among them. Something was wrong. They're all here. Why didn't anyone tell me to come? What's going on? She wondered. She greeted them all with a smile before going up to Ian's room. Then she went inside to see him lying on the bed curled up like a child and sleeping soundly. Part of the bed was illuminated with the sunlight coming from the window. 
making the scene look like it was straight out of a painting. Ian was lying on the dark side of the bed. She took off her shoes, tiptoed over to him, and lay down beside him. They stayed like that, one under the warm sunlight and one in the cold shadow. She moved closer to him and looked at his sleeping face. His brows were drawn together in worry, and she felt her heart ache for him. She reached out her index finger to gently brush away his melancholy. They were so close, yet it wasn't enough for her. Only when she felt his smell fill her nose did she feel that the world was beautiful again, and she finally relaxed. Unconspicuously, Ian wrapped his arm around her and pulled her close. She smiled and closed her eyes, nodding off. When he woke up, it was already dinner time. He looked around at the warm room, basking in the light of the setting sun. He then gazed down at the sleeping woman in his arms and felt like he was dreaming. Her beauty couldn't be described with words. My Madison, he thought. He had never imagined that he would marry a woman after only meeting her twice, let alone her having such a great impact on his life. He hadn't expected them to end up loving each other so deeply. But love was so hard. He stroked her back gently, and he smiled when she scooted even closer to him. He wished that he could slow down time and stay with her there forever. He was so scared of the sweetness of the moment passing. He placed a kiss on her forehead and felt his eyes prickle. Madison sat beside Ian at the dining table that evening, and she could clearly feel Olivia's hostility toward her. She glanced at her husband in confusion, but he acted like he hadn't noticed. He placed food onto her plate and told her to dig in, but she could tell that something had changed. She lowered her head to eat and didn't say a word throughout the entire meal. Her brain was racing to figure out what the problem was, but she couldn't come up with anything. Let's go for a walk, Ian told her once they had finished eating. He grabbed her by the hand and they walked outside. They first took the car to the foot of the mountain, where they then walked together hand in hand. They were surrounded by greenery, and they felt cut off from the rest of the world. Occasionally, a car would drive past them, and the leaves of the roadside would dance. The entire world was filled with the beautiful music of nature itself. Their shadows stretched out, and although they were close to each other, there was a distance between them that couldn't be narrowed. Madison looked up at Ian. What happened to Olivia today? She asked, her eyes filled with doubt and puzzlement. Did you talk? Something seemed off when I was there. He stiffened but quickly recovered and smiled at her. We just talked about business and some things about Daniel and Cassandra. Mom's a little angry. Madison nodded in understanding. She trusted that Ian wouldn't lie to her and ignored Olivia's evident dissatisfaction with her. Because of Allie and Shane? She inquired, bouncing on the soles of her feet. Shane, Ian thought, his jaw tightening. He looked over at her and noticed that she was trying to keep up with him as they walked. He could feel himself becoming inexplicably irritated, and his grip on her hand tightened. She frowned up at him, concerned. Is he angry? He was fine just a minute ago, she thought, shrinking back from the look on his face. The movement struck Ian and he managed to control himself a little. Still, he couldn't help but bark out. Really? Am I always in second place to you? What? What do you mean, she thought, confused. He was always in the first place to her. As soon as the words were out of his mouth, he lost any control that he had. He let go of her hand and came to a stop in front of her. Closing his eyes, he took a series of deep breaths. His hands were clenched into tight fists, and he tried to think of a way to not scare her once he opened his eyes again. He couldn't let himself be controlled by his anger. She watched him, noticing that something was wrong. She wasn't scared, but rather annoyed at his question. Their daughter was about to turn six, yet he still had no trust in her as his wife. She wondered what she had done to make him so insecure. The more she thought about it, the angrier she became. 
Red-faced, she waited for him to open his mouth and explain, or even to look at her. She was about to lose her temper when he finally opened his eyes. He embraced her, and she felt like it was for the last time. Madison, he said into her ear, pulling her close against him as if he wanted to melt into her. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm not doubting you. I promise I'm not. She didn't try to break free of his grip, although she felt wronged by what he had said. She bit her lip and didn't say anything. I'm sorry, Madison. I'm not suspecting you of anything. I'm just... There was no longer any anger in his voice. I'm just jealous. He said the words so softly that he didn't even know if she had heard him at all. He had to admit it, however. He had always cared about her spending time with other men, be it Shane, Zack, or Jason. He especially minded how dazzling she was with them, and that she could forget him so easily when it came to them. In the five years that she had been away, he had never even suspected that she could have lost her memory. He loved her so deeply, but he had also hurt her. He had assumed that she had chosen to eliminate him from her life, but she truly had forgotten everything, and she had even dated Zack for a while. He hated it all, but he couldn't say any of it out loud. Please don't be angry, he pleaded with her, pushing his emotions back down. His words surprised her. She hadn't expected him to be so direct about his feelings, and all of her anger disappeared with his confession. She grabbed his shirt and held it tightly. I want you to do better than this, Ian. How dare you doubt me? She demanded, but her tone carried no threat. He smiled at her, amused. He unwrapped his arms from around her and asked, I'll make sure to do better, my lovely wife. I'll hold you to it. She took his hand, and they continued walking along the empty road. When they got back to the apartment, she sprawled out on the couch lazily, refusing to move. He sat down beside her and began massaging her calves. She took out an apple from the coffee table and bit into it. Who was the friend you met up with? She asked. Tell me about him. I don't want him to think I'm rude the next time he comes. He stiffened and replied, She's my old mentor's daughter. I know her from back when I was studying medicine. She lifted his chin with her fingers and narrowed her eyes at him. Half-jokingly, she said, Should I be worried about her? Why do you know so many women? He raised his eyebrows at her teasing, the look in his eyes gentle. Hmm, you're quite handsome, though, she noted. Don't you think you should be a little more careful with a face like that? He did nothing to disturb her sudden interest in his face, and the look in his eyes only deepened. He rose slowly and pulled her up from the couch, leading her over to the bedroom. He asked her, Hmm, why don't you show me just how handsome you think I am? She blushed and scolded him lightly, but she allowed herself to be led over to the bed. When Madison woke up the next day, Ian was still asleep. She poked him in the chest, pouting. He woke up and grabbed her hand, placing a kiss on top of it. Is there something wrong? He asked her. She shook her head and the phone beside them rang. She picked it up and saw that it was Jason calling. After what had happened to Kelsey, she no longer had much admiration for him as before. She still picked up because of work, but her tone was chipped and strained. Hello? I'm back in the city, came Jason's relaxed voice. It seemed that he had thrown the burden of Kelsey's death off his shoulders completely, especially after the investigation in England had ended. Let's have dinner tonight. You, me, and Allie. We haven't had a meal together in ages, he asked. I don't think Allie will want to go, and I don't feel like going alone today, you know, she said. She tried to come up with an excuse not to attend. She snuggled up against Ian as she refused Jason. She simply didn't want to have more contact than necessary with the man. She thought about how the Wright family was pestering her, and what Henry had said at the banquet. Maybe some other... I've already spoken to Allie and she's coming. She'll come to pick you up later, he said. He cut her off, ruining her plans. Shocked that he would have called Allie just like that, she agreed to go and hung up the phone. She buried her face into Ian's arms. Ugh, she complained, her words muffled. I don't want to go with him. I want to stay home with you today. What should I do? And since when does Allie have such a good relationship with Jason? I hate this, she hissed. 
But all that Ian could hear was Jason and Allie teaming up to take her away from him. He narrowed his eyes and comforted her. When he spoke, he managed to sound unbothered. Why don't you go and see, since they're already going? Tell me what you want to eat, and I can make something for us when you come back. I'm sure you'll be pretty full, though, he whispered. Are you jealous? she asked, looking up at him. He hugged her, trying to make her feel more relaxed. I have no idea what that guy's thinking, but it doesn't matter, does it? You're my wife, not his, he said. She blushed and smiled. She wanted to be only his forever. Nobody would be able to take her away from him. She was struggling with her thoughts about why the man he knows was behaving like this. What she didn't know was that an argument was already on the horizon. And it wouldn't be because of Jason or Shane or Zack, but because of Allie. It was six o'clock in the evening when Allie stopped her car outside Madison and Ian's apartment block and waited for Madison. Before long, Madison came out of the building escorted by Ian. Allie, aren't you busy today? I heard that something happened at Cooper's school. Is everything okay? Madison asked. She had thought that it was strange that Allie had so easily agreed to Jason's request for dinner. Allie looked at her with a smile. It's okay, it's not a big deal. His father went to sort it out. Besides, I haven't seen Jason for ages, and I thought it would be a good chance to catch up, she replied. Madison sat in the passenger seat and bent down to fasten her seatbelt. She didn't notice that Allie and Ian were looking daggers at each other. Mr. Weston, I won't take you with us this time. It's a chance for just the three of us to get together. I'm sure you won't mind missing it, Allie said. Madison didn't notice the change in the way Allie addressed him, but Ian noticed it straight away. By the way, I was thinking of taking Madison back to my place later so that she can sleep over, Allie announced. What? Madison called out in surprise, indicating that she wasn't aware of the arrangement. When did we agree on that? She wondered. Her eyes slightly narrowed as she looked at Allie. You guys go and have fun, Ian said. He gave Allie a knowing look before putting his hand inside the car and stroking Madison's hair. Give me a call when you're done eating, and I'll come and pick you up, he added. Jason nodded her agreement. Ian had already ignored Allie's suggestion that Madison could stay at her house. Allie didn't say anything, but when she looked over at him, she saw that he was smiling stiffly at her. She stepped on the accelerator and drove Madison away heading straight to the restaurant that Jason had booked. On the way there, Allie glanced at Madison. By the way, did you see the document that I asked you to send to Daniel? She asked. I'm sorry, I, I didn't mean to. Madison stammered. She thought that it was a confidential document that she wasn't supposed to read. She had accidentally seen parts of it and felt a little awkward. When I was in the car, I was a bit careless with it and it fell out of the bag, so I accidentally saw it she explained. That's okay, you don't have to feel bad. It wasn't confidential, Allie said. She looked relaxed about it and continued. I looked at it too. I don't know why Daniel was looking for that information. He didn't give me a reason when I asked him about it. That illness sounds quite scary. What do you think? Yes, it does, Madison answered. It looks like it can't be controlled in its later stages and people who suffer from it end up harming themselves and others, she added. She wasn't particularly interested in the illness, but still chatted about it with her friend. I expect it's hard to find out who's got the illness. Didn't it say that those who have it don't show any symptoms in the early stages? Yes, but there are still some clues, Allie said knowingly as she turned the steering wheel. For example, their temper will suddenly become violent, and they start getting suspicious without any reason. They also talk about hurting others. Anyway, I think we should run as far away as possible if we ever met a person like that. They would be very dangerous. Because she was a close friend, Allie hoped that Madison and Ian would separate. She didn't think that a mentally ill man could offer her friend what she needed. She thought that Madison had already suffered a lot, and now she needed some stability in her life. The car stopped at the entrance of the restaurant, and someone came over to park the car for Allie. 
As she got out, Madison said, I don't think we're likely to meet someone like that. Even if we did, we might not realize it straight away. I'm not going to worry about something that's probably never going to happen. Anyway, I've got Ian to protect me. Allie looked at Madison's back and frowned. She just doesn't get it. She's so blind to his faults, she thought. Before she could say anything more about it, Jason came out to welcome them. Great, you guys are here, he said. When he looked at Madison, his face lit up. Madison, long time no see. Madison smiled at him and waited for Allie to join her. Then she grabbed Allie's arm, and they followed him into a private room. Madison was glad that Allie was with her, because it meant the meeting with Jason would be less intense. She was a married woman and part of the Weston family. Although the reporters didn't dare to report her every move, there was still some gossip and unpleasantness in what they said about her. Being a party of three made the dinner less newsworthy. In the private room, the three of them chatted happily. Most of the time, it was Jason and Allie who talked, although Madison contributed from time to time. She was more focused on her food. However, she ate very little. Is there a problem with your meal? Jason asked after noticing that Madison had barely eaten anything. How about I call the manager in and you order something else? He added. There's no need, Madison said as she put down her knife and fork. She looked at all the food on the table and felt a little nauseous. She stood up and said, Sorry, but I need to go to the bathroom. When she walked out of the private room, Madison sighed with relief. She went into the bathroom where she took out her phone and called Ian. Ian, can you make something for me to eat? I'll need to eat when I get home later. The food here isn't as good as the food at home, she asked. Hearing his wife's delicate voice on the phone, some of the emotions that Ian was struggling to control immediately quieted down. No problem. Are you almost done? I can come and pick you up if you want, he replied. He tried to sound casual, but he desperately wanted her to be back at home with him. For him, it would be best if she were locked up with him and no one could see her. However, he knew very well that it wouldn't be good for either of them if he were to become too controlling, so he forced himself to compromise. Standing by the sink, Madison smiled sweetly. I think it would be okay to leave soon. So you can head over now if that's okay with you. It would be better if I were the first to leave. Being here with Jason is only going to attract attention, she said. Ian smiled and agreed. After she hung up, Madison walked out of the bathroom and saw that Jason was waiting at the door. She felt slightly shocked. So you needed to go to the bathroom too. I'll get back to Allie. I don't want her to start thinking about me and you, Madison said as she walked away, trying to make light of the situation. Before she got very far, Jason grabbed her wrist. Using some force, she broke free of his hand and turned back to look at him. Jason frowned and said, Madison, you should be very clear about the Wright family's intentions. He had expected that there would be problems between Madison and Ian after they came back from England. Even if it wasn't a divorce, he had anticipated that there would be tension between them. He knew that Ian had almost lost control of himself in England. He hadn't realized that nothing had happened between them since. He took a step closer to her and gave her a concerned look. The Weston family isn't as friendly as it looks on the surface. You don't know what they're like in private. An innocent person like you is not equipped to survive in that family. You need to divorce Ian. He's not suitable for you, he said. All the while he was speaking, Madison just stared straight at him. She didn't say a word, but her face grew cold as he spoke. He didn't notice her reaction and continued, If you're afraid of losing custody of Sophia... I can help you to keep her. I'll make sure that the Weston family won't be able to touch her. You must believe that I won't harm you. I want to keep you safe. After he spoke, he reached out to hold her hand, but Madison slapped his hand. She looked outraged. I always hoped that we would be able to stay friends. But now it looks like that isn't going to happen. If we can't be friends, then we shouldn't see each other. She replied. The coldness of her words surprised Jason. I don't know what you've been through recently, and I understand if you don't want to talk about it. If you're willing to tell me, I'm here for you, and I'll listen, he offered. Madison calmly stepped away from him. 
I don't know what it is that you think has happened to me, but I'm really annoyed that you're trying to come between me and Ian. You've tried this before, and I let it go for the sake of our friendship. I think friends should be tolerant of one another. But my tolerance for you has reached its limit. I do your way of doing things, and I hate the way you're making insinuations about the Westons. She answered. Jason let her speak without interrupting her. He felt that he was being misjudged, but he still listened to her quietly. Madison took a deep breath and said, To be honest, I didn't expect you to come back from England so soon. I'm not surprised that you've come looking for me. What surprises me is that it's so soon after my sister, my niece, and even my sister's unborn twins died in front of your house. It seems that I saw you as being much more sensitive than you are.